why don't each of you um, tell us a little bit about what you do with the Edge and Service Mesh, just so we can get a little bit of background for those people who aren't familiar with the three famous faces we've got on the screen. And Alyssa, why don't you start, because your name starts with A. Okay, um, so hi, my name's Alyssa. Uh, I've been at Google for about 13 years working on the GFE, which is Google's frontline proxy. It takes in all of Google's web traffic, everything from Gmail to ads to web search. Um, so it's it's pretty critical bit of Google's infrastructure. So I worked on that for a decade. I launched HTTP2 at Google. I launched HTTP3 at Google. And then Google got interested in this proxy called Envoy. Um, and I was kind of like, what, why are, you know, we spent a decade working on the GFE, you know, why Envoy? And started playing around with it and got really interested. It's just a beautiful architecture. It's super pluggable. Um, and so I spent the last three years working on Envoy, both trying to get it up to kind of the Google level cloud uh, reliability standards, um, and also adding features and becoming a senior maintainer uh, along the way. Fabulous, thanks. So um, Lynn, alphabetically, we'll roll around to you um, and we'll let Matt blush with, with pride about Envoy as the last speaker. So Lynn, why don't you tell us a little about yourself and what you do? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, uh, so I worked on uh, uh, Istio uh, for almost, gosh, a little bit over three years now. So that's my primary interaction with the Edge. Uh, so you guys all know Istio has the ingress gateway uh, and the egress gateway uh, for the part of the Edge. So my primary role on Istio is uh, contributing to upstream. Uh, so I'm a maintainer on the project. I contribute primarily to like user experience and also uh, environments. I also serve on the technical oversight committee of Istio. So it's been an interesting ride. Fabulous. And um, so Matt, um, alphabetically last in a, in a set of three, um, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and, and of course, Probably everyone knows you, but you should still say something for those few people who are watching who don't actually know. Of course. Thanks for having me. My name is Matt. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Lyft, where I've been for five and a half years. Uh, these days, I spend about half of my time leading our infrastructure team at Lyft. So uh, things like networking and Kubernetes and deploys and all of those types of things. And then I spend about 50 to 60% of my time working on Envoy in the open source domain. Uh, prior to Lyft, I was at Twitter where I built Twitter's Edge proxy. So that was actually my first main experience with the Edge. Uh, and you know, having that experience back at Twitter was, was what led me to build Envoy. And of course, Envoy is used in a whole different number of domains from uh, service mesh systems to API gateways. So my, my experience spans all of those domains. So do you, do you three have some, um, some real world stories of putting these into practice to talk about how some of these things went, they went well, or some of the places where maybe there were some things that you had to think some more about as, as part of that? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, that any migration comes with migration pain. Uh, my, my new hire project at Google was launching GFE2, which was taking the proxy handling all of our traffic and hot swapping it to a new proxy, which of course, you know, a thousand small differences uh, add up to a bunch of um, interesting uh, debugging examples. Um, and Envoy is, is no exception, right? Like one of one prime example that we had early on was that because Envoy was written for HTTP2, it lowercases all header keys, right? Which is HTTP2 standard. Um, but we're dealing with legacy traffic. Legacy traffic often expects HTTP 1.1 style capitalization, right? You have a content length header, it starts with capital C, it has a capital L. Um, and theoretically, if you're following the spec, which no one does, um, you should be able to handle either casing, but no one does, right? So when you have say 20,000 cloud customers, um, it's guaranteed that not all of them do it right, right? And so, you know, for example, there were a lot of internal debates as to how that Google should handle that in Envoy, uh, which were preempted by someone else running into it first uh, and writing the camel case HTTP 1.1 option. So you can, you can kind of work around that particular issue, right? But for any migration, there's going to be dozens of little impedance mismatches. Oh, you reordered the headers differently, or I expected a, a space here between commas, which, which we hit internally. Um, and it just takes time to debug. And we've done a lot of work in the last year for Envoy, making it easier and easier to debug what is actually flowing through the system, um, what your data actually looks like, when things are rejected, why they are, uh, to try to at least ease the pain of that migration. 
Yeah, that's the really key point is that, you know, all of these systems theoretically exist on standards, but as Alyssa said, it's pretty, pretty fuzzy, right? You know, it, it's, and I think everyone runs into these issues and stepping back to Envoy itself and in terms of one of the original value propositions, at least uh, at least compared to its open source competitors is Envoy has really focused on the observability side of things. So, so trying to better understand what's going on through metrics, logging, tracing, things like that. And um, I, I think just given that you're going to hit not only all of these migration problems, but even apart from migration, just trying to roll out a system just, just a service mesh or any other component where you're dealing with a polyglot code base with 10 different languages and frameworks, it, it gets super, super messy. So I, I think that that is really the underlying crux of it is understanding that things are going to break. And actually, as Alyssa was saying, focusing on the tooling and the observability and the diagnostics to allow you to understand it is probably the most important part. So, so my guess is that the audience um, who's listening to the panel is all of a sudden excited. It's like, give us some specific examples from the three of you's um, work so far of where this debugging sort of thing has worked or maybe not worked as well. Um, I'll, I'll start by just saying that uh, I'm going to be honest. It's very hard for me to remember the one exciting thing. And by that, I mean, I've just... I've dealt with so many different problems and different bugs that they just they just kind of blur together. That that that's that, that's just the way that it is. And I would I would answer a slightly different question, which is going to be a, an unpopular opinion probably, but these systems, as we're talking about right now, they're so complicated. Like any time that you you know have a service oriented or microservice architecture. It ends up becoming very tricky very quickly because of different languages, because of uh, bugs, just just because of faults, right? I mean, it's just so many things can go wrong. That my advice to people typically is don't don't do any of this unless you actually have to, because it's very very painful, right? So I I, I think that to, to the extent that folks can look at the problems that they're trying to solve in terms of if they can limit the number of application languages, do that, right? If you can limit the number of services, do that. If you can use a cloud provider for ingress, do that, right? It's like, don't just don't implement any of this. I think at a certain organizational size, you know, that becomes un unrealistic and you end up with services, you end up with an API gateway and you end up with all of these things. But, um, the, the problems in my experience, and I'd be curious to hear from others, they're just endless. I, it's like, they just never end. I mean, there's just a never ending array of bugs. Um, and it'd be hard, hard, it'd be hard for me to come up with anyone in particular. I mean, I would say, oh, go for it, Lynn. Go, go, go ahead. The, the kind of two classes of bugs are gonna be, you know, control plane or data plane, right? And, and we've done a lot of work to make them easier to diagnose, right? So a lot of the time for control plane bugs, you have, especially for, as Lynn said, the uh, the configuration language is not the easiest. It at least explains what you're doing wrong. Hey, you have field A, that means you need field B, or this is out of bounds range, you're not setting a reasonable value, you know, maybe look at the docs. Um, for data plane, again, I've, I've personally done a bunch of instrumentation over the last year. So this morning I got into a bug report saying, hey, you know, connect, uh, is it working when I try to do domain match? You know, if I say match all wildcard domains, it passes through, and if I say match local host, it, it bounces. And I was like, oh no, I didn't test this. Let me go, let me go debug what's going on. Um, and so I wrote an integration test um, and ran it and the debug detail said route not found. So that's great. I know that it, the route match failed. And then the log said, you know, that host colon 80 didn't match. And I'm like, oh yeah, I wrote, I copied what they did. I did local host or, or host and the matcher should be colon 80, right? It took me five minutes to debug it basically between uh, between logs and response code details, right? And so as you know, you ask kind of what are the common gotchas and what we've done because the Envoy, the actual core Envoy maintainer community is, is quite small. Um, there's a group of devs who aren't maintainers, you know, who are, who are awesome and really good at answering questions. But when we see questions like this happening over and over, why is Envoy sending this response? You know, why is my config not working? We'll put up an example so people can copy paste edit or um, you know, well, we wrote a fact, you know, why is Envoy sending this response? Here's how you turn on these logs. Here's how you get the details here. Here's how you turn up trace logging. 
um, that that tend to at least give the the common debug tools and hopefully you know reduce confusion and or outage time. Yeah, I want to echo some of what's just been said. I mean, it's definitely hard. I remember even early this year, just the Istio project itself, right? We actually went back from microservices to monolithic. And because of some of the challenges are hard, right? Some of the, we had like four, five, six control plane components and we consolidated into one single component because we find out we're not enjoy the benefit of microservices. We don't have multiple languages. And uh, we had a lot of communication issue among our own microservices, uh, which could be solved if we just communicate through local hosts. And we would deliver and release all these components always together. So we actually went back to say, you know, we don't need microservices. We don't need to consume our own service mesh. And we were actually a lot happier now just having one single control plane component. Like Matt said, I mean, if you don't actually need it, the best might be just avoid it. Um, in fact, uh, from our project perspective, we were amazed on uh, how many issues we have and how many issues we discover with Envoy also. It's just like, you know, we think, you know, the project like Istio is almost four years. And if you count the pre-incubation, it's almost five years. And Envoy also being a, a long, around for a long time. But like Matt said, you know, it's just uh, deep, people have different scenarios and someday, you know, people are going to discover something new. And this also regression and all that. So it's super complicated. And the one thing I would highlight is um, someone from Auto uh, Trader, Carl Stoney, wrote a really good blog. Uh, you know, when you have service A talk to service B direct with outside car, you're worried about one connection pool, right? The, the moment you inject the sidecar, um, you're worried about like three connection pools. So you actually increase your chance of things might going wrong. And the most common problem in service mesh is the 503 error. So any of the time, out configuration, if they conflict, you know, all these uh, issues from your connection pool, you may just get a generic 503 and it could take a long time for you to troubleshooting and realize what might be wrong. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, actually, if you were to push me to one of the most common issues that comes up over and over and over again is that in these architectures, you wind up with this chain of proxies, right? Just like Lynn was saying, I mean, you can have an edge proxy, a second layer edge proxy, a service, a sidecar, some intermediary. And often it's the timeout config that ends up getting really messy and confuses people a lot. And particularly with protocols like HTTP 1.1, which don't deal with those timeout races very well. That was solved in HTTP 2. But we have a, a constant stream of issues that come into Envoy mm -hmm. and to other projects about why is it disconnecting? And you have to explain that, well, you have to actually configure the timeouts correctly across all the different layers. It's just, it's very complicated. Yeah. Avoid. Instead of avoid, because we're, we're speaking to a knowledgeable audience out there, I want to poke at this a little bit more and maybe learn a few lessons from the three of you about how to find those timeout problems. The details, I mean, I, I added this into Envoy, but I added it because it's one of our most powerful debug tools for the GFE. So every single time Envoy sends a local response, it tags uh, a specific detail that is unique across the code base. So you can literally say, say detail A maps to this line of code in this file, right? So you can see exactly which timeout caused. And if you chain those in headers, so in your, in your response headers, you always say the details of this response was forwarded by the backend and the details of this one was whatever, then either by looking at access logs or response headers, if they make it to you, um, you can see exactly which proxy in the chain failed and exactly what line of code it failed at. Then you still have to debug, wait, why did this one time out and these two not time out? But at least you've, you've root caused you know, where it happened, not why it happened. 
And I would add, uh, you know, thanks to Envoy and Service Mesh Project, these problems are actually surface a lot easier than used to, right? Because now you can observe what's going on with your microservices a lot easier. So you can actually see maybe you have this problem at, nine, uh, at just 0.5%, where before, if it's 0.5%, you may not even know. And it, you may just live with it. It's just because of the service mesh and the platform like Envoy, all these issues are surface to the user right away. So they actually have the chance to debugging and troubleshooting, like Alisa said, you know, having um, like the debugging tool to figure out what might go uh, wrong so that you can tweak that timeout and maybe tweak out retry and the, to further configure your system to be, to be more tolerant. What I would add too, which is which is super interesting, is that when we when we raise a bunch of these issues to the user, what I found personally, and and, and this is um, there's a fair amount of irony here, is that issues that a user may never have noticed previously, like very low rate issues, they now notice and they think it's a severe problem, right? And then they'll spend a bunch of time debugging it or asking questions and that's fine. I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with, you know, having all of this all of the stuff raised and trying to figure out what's going on. But the the thing that I would add is uh, with, I would say with great observability comes great power and great responsibility. And, and what I've seen sometimes is that people can get hyper-focused on very small issues and not look at the big picture in terms of the overall system reliability. So I, I think as operators of the system, this is where what I was saying before, I, I don't mean to keep saying, don't use this technology. I'm just saying that it is a powerful system. As you add on all of these layers, it becomes more and more complicated. And I, I just think it's important to realize that there's a lot of intuition here. Like there's a reason that Alyssa has been working on this for like 15 years, right? It's because there's a lot of experience that you gain from the way the patterns that, that things break and then being able to look at the big picture and try to understand, is that really a big issue or not? So um, I, I would just add that it gets really complicated, not even just the system, but just trying to take in all of the inputs and understand, should you even action on them, right? It's like, what should you alarm mm -hmm. on? Should you care about this? And that's where there's no, in, in my experience, there's no, um, there's no substitute for operational experience here and, and getting a team together who can operate these things, whether it be something like SDO or some other service mesh or an API gateway and just getting a feel for how things fail and whether it matters. And, and that just takes time. Yeah, I, I actually want to add on to that because that that is a huge problem and that's not one that any proxy can solve. You know, as Matt says, you often have these really low rate of errors, right? And low rate of error, eh, it's not a big problem unless it's consistent 100% error for mm -hmm. some user on some platform in some country, right? And it and it gets really hard to figure out, is this a low rate of error, but a high rate for some class of users or some class of networks? Um, and that is an art where our SRE are amazing at that, our, our reliability engineers um, and the operations people just have developed that experience over time. I've I've picked up some over, you know, debugging some number of Google outages over some number of decades, but, um, but yeah, there's, there's no, you know, there, there's a science to the basics and then the rest of it is all art and intuition that you develop over time. Other sort of key measures or thought processes might you imagine, or not imagine, that you've seen um, for success or not success on going to say a service mesh sort of situation. What other things might people who are watching this panel use as criteria to decide, oh, this is a good way for us to go, or this is maybe not a good way for us to go. We should have fewer services or a monolith or something. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, size is certainly, certainly an important uh, characteristic. The second thing I would look at is what programming languages are they using? You know, are they really have multiple programming languages or are they just 
primarily using one single programming language like we have in Istio with our control plane, we have six, seven components, but all using the same language. So it didn't make sense for us. Um, the third thing I would look at is, uh, you know, are they actually operating the services by different people? Are they actually release the services on different schedule? Because that helps to make the decision to, because the purpose of microservices go faster, right? Release on different schedule. But if you're not really doing that, then you're not really enjoy the benefit of microservices. Um, so that's definitely a key criteria to also look at. And then the the fourth thing I think important is, uh, you know, are they partner with somebody or are they actually consume open source directly? How much experience the organization have to consume open source technologies? If they just consume Envoy and Istio uh, and other uh, open technologies out there because it does rem uh, require a lot of experience in adopting open source technologies. So hopefully they have some experience in the past that would help them easy the transition to adopt to these technologies. I guess one thing I would add is not just considering team size, but also for larger companies, considering where you can join forces. You know, Lynn mentioned uh, the control plane. Well, if, you know, if you're one team of five people, yeah, it doesn't make sense to run your own microservices and run your own control plane. Like that, that would take all of your people. Um, but if you have a bunch of different small teams across a company, right, where you could join forces and have, you know, one operations team that, that kind of handled that and had an escalation path and built those muscles and a bunch of small teams leveraging it, that can be a really powerful model. Um, we, we tend to have a very strong infrastructure teams at Google. Um, and I've been surprised kind of repeatedly uh, working on the Envoy side, how many companies kind of are, are more siloed, right? And have different teams kind of all rolling their own. Uh, and again, it's, it's, harder, it's harder to work together, right? To, to be able to coordinate, you know, what rollout schedule makes sense and what, you know, what the security release processes make sense for each team. But if you can do it, you can avoid a lot of repeated work and you can really build up those, those strong teams with deep expertise. It can be really helpful obviously not relevant to the small startups that don't have enough teams to actually do that. But, but for, you know, medium and large companies, for sure, it's something to think about. Yeah, those are both uh, super answers. The only, the only other thing that I would add is that when it comes to the API gateway side of things, you know, the North South or the service mesh East West, I would also ask people to really look at a, what, what problems are they actually trying to solve? And by that, I mean, is your system actually actually real time, right? It's like, do you, do you have to have low latency, right? It's like, do you, do you have to have synchronous API calls? And sometimes stepping back and trying to understand, could you develop your system on top of PubSub? You know, could it be lossy, right? It's like, there can be, it can be other architectural patterns, which you're just, much simpler than trying to get a giant microservice call graph to actually work. It's a very complicated technical thing that is not that is not easy to do. So my advice from people, even apart from the, you know, stay on your monolith, don't adopt microservices if you if you can, you know, is um, is to look at the actual ap application use case and say. Do I need real-time communication? Does it have to be synchronous? Are there simpler ways that I can actually do this that tend to be easier to debug, a bit more reliable? Um, so that, that would be my other main high-level piece of advice. Fabulous. Well, I think that, that that bit of advice that the three of you have just offered is, is great for the, the audience who's been listening to us to, to go away with about the size and the expertise and the looking at the architecture issues. Um, I, I'll give you all a, a, a final chance to say anything that you, you wanted to say other than thanks and you know, so long and thanks for all the fish, but, um, and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll call it good and answer questions from the audience uh, during, during the actual panel um, uh, broadcast. So um, is there anything that you'd like to, like to sum up with there, Alyssa? Um, I guess I would say that if, if you have done the analysis Matt suggested and decide that, that microservices is the way to go or, or Envoy for your uh, ingress traffic, or you decide to adopt Istio, is a recommendation to just really try to get involved in the community. Um, it's, it, open source is an amazing thing because you can be like, hey, I don't have to write my own proxy, I'm just going to take this one. And you can just take it and use it, and that's great. Um, 
and so, and many many people like go with that model and it works fine for them. Um, I've seen a lot of people kind of come in late in the game and be like, wait, I need help figuring this out or, or how to add this thing or I want to do this flourish. And if you get involved in the communities early, um, both Istio and Envoy have really strong developer communities. We've got a great maintainer team. There's you know active Slack channels. And if you get involved, the more you get involved in the community, the faster you get your questions answered, the easier it is to get your features landed, the easier it is to, to, to basically get everything working the way you want to work. So it's, it's this kind of bootstrapping thing where like you put in that initial effort and you get way more out. So it's an option. Not everyone has the time to do it. Not everyone has the cycles to do it, especially if you're early on in a startup. But once you get to the point where you have some breathing room, it really is valuable to be proactive and just reach out and be like, hey, let me help out with a little bit of tech debt. And then I get my brownie points and now people answer my questions faster um, because it's all volunteer work, right? And, and the more you volunteer to help, the more people are gonna volunteer to help you. Um, and you know, we always love help too. How about you, Lynn? I would say, you know, definitely spend time to understand whether you need service mesh. I think it's really worthwhile your time to spend that time up front to do thorough evaluations. And then once you decide uh, which project you are going to land, uh, I definitely agree with Alyssa, you know, spend that time to work with community and don't be frustrated because we're all volunteers. So sometimes it might take a little bit of patience, take a little bit of pain. You may need to attend the community meeting or a work group meeting. So don't be shy. We would definitely welcome contributions. Yeah, um, I don't have a ton to add other than those two, two statements, which are great. I, I think the, the only thing that I would add is that, and we've talked about it during this panel, is that I think as an industry, we're, we're not that great of evaluating what I call total cost of ownership, you know, and that's looking at how much would it cost if I'm going to pay a vendor or how much am I, it's going to cost if I use this open source and, and I have to actually maintain it myself or if I'm going to make my own control plane or all of these things. So I just really encourage people to, when you're trying to solve your problems, to look at the entire menu of options, you know, from using open source directly to paying a vendor to hiring people internally and, and try to be realistic about what the costs actually are. And that's where um, I think things will wind up in a much better place for most or most organizations if they spend more time doing that because then they'll have less surprises later. Fabulous. Well, I'm going to summarize your three uh, final points with I'm going to say that Matt said, look for simpler options, which I like as a general life philosophy and definitely when you're writing software. Um, Lynn said, carefully consider your requirements, which again, I think is a fabulous thing when you're doing software. And uh, Alyssa said, make friends early, which I think we all learned when we were in kindergarten. And with that, I thank all of you for being part of this panel. Um, I think it's gonna be great when we finally do broadcast it at KubeCon. And so thanks so much for being part of it.